On this episode of This Week in Linux, we've got a lot of great news. This show is just jam-packed. YouTube DL's repo has been restored by GitHub. Pine64 announced a new KDE community edition of the Pine phone, and I am so excited to talk about this. We've got some distro news for Kali Linux, SUSE, and a new Ubuntu remix aimed at being an alternative to Chrome OS. We've also got some Mozilla news to discuss with the latest release of Firefox 83 and their new DOH rollout, and we'll talk about what that means. We'll also get a new image editor app to check out called Laz Paint. All that, so much more coming up right now on your weekly source for Linux GNU's. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean and by Bitwarden. More on those later in the show. Welcome to episode 126 of This Week in Linux, a weekly Linux news podcast, a part of the Destination Linux network. I'm Michael Tunnell, and if you're new to the show, this is the show that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take on the latest topics using my over 20 years experience as a Linux user. Before we get started this week, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. If you didn't hear, the 200th episode of Destination Linux happened this past week, so check out the latest episode. It is just fantastic. We covered so many t great topics, and the live stream was awesome. So unfortunately, you can't watch the live stream anymore because it already happened. We also had a Game Fest right after that, which we you can actually watch the game stream if you'd like to. There's a lot of great stuff in there. We also played Among Us, which was just hilarious. And you definitely need to check that out because there was some times where I showed I had no idea how you used to play that game and it was fantastic. I'll have a link in the show notes below for that if you want to check out the DLN Game Fest and all of the shenanigans and nonsense that ensued there. Also, are you aware that this show is streamed live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time or 1800 UCC? This is actually something that a lot of people don't know, that the show is very different on the live version because in between each segment, we also have like a kind of a chat about the topic or just in general and hang out. And sometimes there's even random tangents that could last for 20 minutes. Who knows? So if you want to hang out and ch check out the live stream, there's so much content in addition to the actual show itself that is recorded on the stream. So be sure to check that out. And also, if you want to be a patron, you could join me live on the show and in the stream and have a conversation directly in addition, as well as the patron post show that happens at the end of every stream. So that's cool too. Go to the, the tuxdigital.com slash contribute to find out more about how to become a patron or just join us live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time or 1800 UTC. Also, be sure to check out the DLN store where you can get all sorts of swag. That's uh, hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, stickers, and a, a bunch more. And we're actually going to be adding more items to the to the store. So go to dlnstore.com to check that out. And also check out the Because Collection, which is a variety of... It's, it's basically like kind of instead of just different things that are specific to a show, it's just fun kind of things such as the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt is in that collection. And you may be wondering, why is it called the Because Collection? Well, the reason they're all collected together is because. Yep, that's it. So, you know, check out the dlnstore.com to get all the great stuff that is there. And, you know, just remember the merch itself is just as important as the destination. A first in the show this week, we have a follow-up for the YouTube DL fiasco at GitHub. So the repo has been restored or reinstated by GitHub, which is great. And we'll talk about that and why they did it, as well as we'll talk about something that the GitHub team is doing that is very interesting that is going forward in terms of the future of how they handle these kinds of things as well as a fund they're going to be setting up we'll talk about that in a bit but the github team says in their quote when they're on their reinstatement they say today we have reinstated youtube dl a popular project on github after we received additional information about the project that enabled us to reverse a digital millennium copyright act or dmc ca takedown as a platform we must comply with laws even ones that we don't think are fair for developers Less than 2% of the DMCA takedowns we process are based on circumvention claims, and of those 2%, this was a particularly unusual case. DMCA takedown claims based on circumvention are a growing industry-wide issue for developers with far-reaching implications. And they go on to list some other things, but I want to switch to the statements that the EFF uh, state in their, in their announcement or their, their argument about this, because the EFF 
argument is essentially one of the reasons why the GitHub decided to change their position because there's not been a ruling on it or anything. It's not like it's been declared fair use. GitHub just decided that they don't agree with the DMCA takedown and they're willing to make a decision prior to any kind of legal decisions uh, being applied to this particular case. So the EFF states... The tool is used by journalists, activists, and sa- save I- to save eyewitness videos, by YouTubers to save backup copies of their own uploaded videos, and by people who have slow or unreliable network connections to download videos in high res- resolution and watch them without having to buffer or you deal with buffering interruptions. Just to name a few things that what this thing offers. Uh, the RIA's an, an argument hinges on a section of the DMCA that is section 1201, which says that it's illegal to bypass a digital lock in order to access or modify a copyrighted work or to provide t- tools that for users to bypass digital locks. However, the EFF also states that in their letter to the, Git, the GitHub to explain the issue is that this is not really what this is anyway, so it shouldn't matter. So the EFF says YouTube DL does not infringe or encourage the infringement of any copyrighted works and its re- references to copyrighted songs in its source code is unit tests, which are fair use. YouTube DL does not violate Section 1201 of the DMCA because it does not circumvent any technical protection measurements or measures on YouTube's videos. The EFF has explained that the signature code used by YouTube, what RIA calls a rolling cipher, isn't a protected digital lock. And if it were, YouTube DL doesn't circumvent it, but simply uses it as it, as it was intended. So even though that some there's not really even a, a cipher, rolling cipher anyway, they don't use it beyond what it's supposed to be used for anyway. So, you know, it's a completely invalid claim that that's what they're doing. So that's what basically the EFF is saying. So this is really interesting because not only is GitHub... Re, but putting the reinstating the repo back up, they also are doing a bunch of other stuff. But they before we get to that section, they talked about the kind of the review process that they have for these kinds of claims, and they are saying that they're going to overhaul all of this stuff. So GitHub's overhauling the year 1201 review process, and they're saying that the 1201 takedown claims will be reviewed by technical es- experts, including when appropriate independent specialists retained by GitHub. Claims will be carefully scrutinized by legal experts. Ambiguous claims will err on the side of the developer and just ignore it, essentially. If the claim passes, they'll contact the repository owner and give them a chance to respond. Only once these steps have been completed will a repository be taken down. So basically, these are the, they're, they're massively changing the way they handle this particular situation. Uh, go, so all the situations like this going forward Will, will be in a much better situation for the developers, which is great because essentially this means that the YouTube DL repo takedown, while very annoying, didn't really hurt YouTube DL, but also created a precedent for GitHub to actually fix the way that the takedowns are being processed, which is great. So good job, RIA, for making it better for developers. You know, good job, whatever. So repository owners will still have... Uh, will still be able to export their issues, PRs, and other repository data that do not contain the alleged circumvention code where legally possible. GitHub will staff uh, their on their trust and safety frontline team to respond to developer tickets as well. And in addition to all of this, not just rechanging the process and making it a bit better for developers, they're actually going to be creating a developer defense fund, which is just awesome. So GitHub will has says that they're going to, this is from the GitHub blog, they say that GitHub will establish and donate $1 million to a developer defense fund to help protect open source developers on GitHub from unwarranted DMCA section 1201 takedown claims. We will immediately begin working with other members of the community to set up this fund and take other measures to collectively protect developers and safeguard developer collaborations. This is awesome because it's not only is a reinstating the thing, they're also putting the money where their mouth is type of thing and say that we're going to, if, if this kind of happens again, we're going to actually put our own money and say, you know, create a defense fund to help those people who are typically no, if they're making open source software, they're not usually making money off of it. So it makes it a very difficult them to defend themselves and the, creating this defense fund to help those developers defend it is just fantastic. So good job GitHub for that. And also again, great for the EFF to, you know, take the, the, the reins of this kind of this, this situation and help out the YouTube DL project doing this. And if you want to com- uh, donate to the EFF and help them basically address all these 
annoying things that happen. No. If you want to find out more about this particular topic, I'll have a link to the EFF article uh, post about this, as well as the blog post from GitHub about the reinstatement in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the latest announcement from Pine64, and that is the KDE Community Edition of the Pine Phone, which is really awesome. It's going to be on pre-order available December 1st, so that is fantastic. So basically, if you're not familiar, the KDE Community, KDE Community Edition is going to be using Plasma Mobile. So Plasma Mobile is a mobile u- user interface that is bu- built by the KDE Community, and this is based on like, it's, it's a very cool thing because it's, it's kind of... It's essentially a convergent interface of the KDE Plasma desktop. So it's essentially the same underlying technologies and apps that you're already using on your desktop or laptop that is is powering this this device, which is really cool. So uh, also $10 from each phone sold will go towards the funding of KDE, so that's fantastic too. And what's really awesome, in addition to having Plasma Mobile on it, because I'm a big fan of Plasma, for those who are not familiar, I'm a very big fan of Plasma. Uh, the KDE Connect is also something I'm very, I'm very fan, very big, big fan of. Uh, KDE Connect allows you to have your Pine phone and your desktop connected to manage storage, manage uh, messages and notifications and clipboard sync and all that stuff. Very, very cool. The fact that the Plasma Mobile version of the Pine phone will also have KDE Connect because I'm a Big fan of both of those things. And it's also going to have a lot of cool uh, features like desktop apps like Ocular. And I don't know if you're supposed to say it's V-V-A-V-E. I'm, it, spo- it looks like Wave because of the two Vs that are capitalized. Or if it's just Vave, I don't know. But either way, that music player will also be available on the phone, which is really cool. And the KDE team is a quote from them saying that, Developed by free software volunteers from around the world, contributing their time and knowledge, Plasma Mobile is a direct derivation from uh, KDE's successful Plasma desktop and offers total privacy, user control, and the promise of truly convergent environment and applications. I am so happy to see them doing this because it's just very cool. I'm not going to go through the details of the specs of the phone because the phone is essentially the same as the previous edition, the previous community edition, Uh, but... There are two different types of the devices that you can get. You can get the standard version or the convergence package. Now, I would typically just suggest get the convergence package because in addition to the convergence dock that you get, that's a USB-C type dock, you also get a bigger device. You get a a more powerful device. So it's got a three gigabyte RAM instead of two gigabyte RAM. And I think you also get more storage on the convergence dock as well or the convergence package version. So it's uh, an extra fifty dollars, so it's one forty nine for the standard, one ninety nine for the convergence package. But for me, I would suggest get the convergence package because it's a better deal because it's only an extra fifty bucks and you get a bunch of other stuff with it. So that's what I did when I got the post market OS version, and that's what I think everyone should do if you're going to purchase this. There's also some other things I want to talk about because in addition to the Pine Phone KDE edition, they also uh, announced some other stuff in their latest blog post. And that uh, that's, uh, first of all, I want to talk about the Pinebook Pro docking deck, which is a USB-C dock available later this month for $40, $40 $39.99 basically. And it allows you to have uh, a bunch of USB ports, also uh, uh, HDMI ports and stuff like that. Just a lot of cool stuff that allows you to do extra stuff with the Pinebook Pro with this dock attachment. And I think that it's very, very cool. They also done some improvements to the Pine Time, and they said that the uh, Pine Seal, which is I love the fact that it's, it's like a pin, it's a solder, it's a soldering iron basically, um, but it's it's called Pine Seal, which makes me uh, I love the the dad joke pun of that name because it's pencil, Pine Seal, Pine Seal, whatever I like it. Anyway, this is going to enter production very soon and will be later uh, be available to order pretty much you know fairly soon. They say within a couple months or so. So I am excited to see that. Uh, also, there's an update to the Pine Phone in terms of people who have previous versions of the phone. So they say that we're happy to let you know that the standalone 3 gigabyte RAM, 32 gigabyte eMMC flash main boards are now available for purchase from the Pine Store. And they say that we made the decision to sell the main boards at a significant discount to Braveheart and U- UbiPort's CE owners who wish to upgrade their device because those the Convergence package was not available for those particular versions or editions of the phone. So this is awesome because they're making it possible for those who have those versions to upgrade their phone fairly simply 
which is really cool. They say, consider it a thank you for being early adopters. We really appreciate you supporting us in our quest to bring Linux on mobile to a wider audience. For those who wish to learn more about this newest revision of the PinePhone main board, we'll have links in the show notes for the blog post, as well as if you want to learn more about any of this stuff that we talked about from Pine64, we'll have links in the show notes below. Up next in the show, we're going to do some distro news. And in this case, we're going to talk about an unofficial Ubuntu flavor that is created for an alternative for Chrome OS and Chromebooks. And that is Ubuntu Web Web Remix. So Ubuntu Web Remix. This is actually made from the same people who make the Ubuntu Unity Remix. And it's based on Ubuntu 2004 LTS. And in addition to being an alternative to Chrome OS, it also doesn't use Chrome or Chromium in order to make this function. They're actually using Mozilla's Firefox web browser, which is awesome. So it also offers support for various web apps. It's got some web apps by default, but it also allows you to make web apps and you can install regular Linux applications from Ubuntu software repositories as well. So if you want to use app to install, you can just get it from the repo and install whatever you want. Now it's it's using GNOME 3.36 as the DE, which is kind of interesting to me because GNOME is not known as being the lightest weight actually it's the heaviest de that i know of so it's kind of odd that that's the one used for something that's a chromium or chrome os uh, alternative so that's interesting but they're also in addition to having the web apps and the ability to do installation of linux applications they also have added the support for anbox which allows you to run android applications on it which is very interesting because chrome os does have that functionality as well so that's why i think they they added that so it's very interesting uh, overall, if you're looking for a distribution that is an alternative to Chrome OS, then maybe check out Ubuntu Web Remix, and I'll have links to it in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new app platform service, which is a solution to build modern cloud-native apps. With App Platform, you can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites quickly and easily. Simply point to your GitHub repository and let the App Platform do all the heavy lifting for you. It also has support for multiple languages like Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, and more, including Docker. Uh, DigitalOcean also runs their app platform on their own infrastructure so that your costs are significantly lower than with other products. And their their infrastructure is being powered by DigitalOcean Kubernetes, providing a smoother migration path so you can take more control of your infrastructure setup. And as a listener of This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you get start you can get started for free. Actually, no, better than free because Digital DigitalOcean is going to be giving you a $100 free credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, you can get started with a $100 free credit by going to do.co slash DLN to start started on DigitalOcean's new app platform service. And we want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is the latest release of one of the most popular penetration testing distributions available, and that is Kali Linux. 2020.4 has been released. So a quote from the blog post from Kali Linux, they say, thank you to everyone who provided positive and constructive feedback. We are happy with it and hope you are too because ZS, ZSH will be the default shell on our desktop images and cloud. So ZSH is the new default shell for Kali Linux. We talked about it on a previous episode in more details. If you want to know more about that, I'll have a link in the show notes below for that episode. So you can talk, we talk about the difference between the why they're doing from ZSH or bash to ZSH and all that stuff. So you can check that out. And they're also doing a, a, a makeover basically for the bash shell to make it look, look more like ZSH. So when you switch back and forth, it'll be very similar looking. So that's pretty interesting as well. Uh, they've also have new, several new tools available called Apple Blee, uh, Cert Graph, D- DNS, Cat2, Final Recon, Go Do or G G O D O H for the D O H thing we're going to talk about in the next uh, next couple of topics. Uh, also, they have a, a new tool, tool for uh, called What Mask, and they've also updated the Metasploit framework to version six. And they've also done some improvements to a variety of other things. But this, what I think is pretty interesting, is that uh, they're doing a, a, a partnership with two tool author, authors. So they're teaming up with uh, two authors that one makes a, ver- a variety of different uh, high value tools, and another one is now pulling from a private source. So Kali Linux users will be able to get access to the newest changes 30 days before the tool is made public. And this is from the CME team or uh, Crack Map Exec. Team and also the other one is from um, Byte Bleeder, but all of the E's are replaced with threes because naturally. 
And Kelly says that the code will be distributed with a banner saying something along the lines of for Kali users only. And this is related to the uh, CME Kali package. And they're saying removing alternate code will break the software license, thus breaking copyright law. So don't be that guy. So this is interesting because it shows that because Kali Linux has already been known for being a, you know, the number one or in terms of like popularity wise of hacking based distributions or penetration testing things. But now they're having a partnership to get even more stuff or more reasons to use Kali Linux. So that's pretty cool. But I do want to be clear that if you are not a penetration tester or you're not looking to get into that field, you should not be using Kali Linux just period, because a lot of people think that because this is a distribution built to break through systems that it means it ought, it, it should have like really good security but it doesn't because it's not meant for that it's meant to break security not harden security i mean technically speaking you are hardening their security by breaking it but that's different i'm talking about the distro itself doesn't really focus on being the most secure thing ever so if that's what you're looking for you should not be checking out kali linux in terms for that and also, you shouldn't really use it for your daily driver anyway, unless you are a professional pen tester and that sort of stuff, because you know what you need to do in order to make sure that it's possible to use a daily driver. They typically themselves suggest that you don't do that because it's not the purpose of it. Technically, you could do it, but you probably shouldn't. Anyway, there's a lot of uh, new other new changes like the WinKex or the it has an, a new enhanced session mode for the WinKex to ARM devices and a bunch of other things. Uh, if you want to learn more about the latest release of Kali Linux 2020.4, I'll have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the latest release of Mozilla's Firefox web browser, which is my favorite web browser. If you're curious about why it's my favorite web browser, check out the link in the show notes and the description where I had a video where I talked about my, my top seven reasons why Firefox is my favorite browser. So check that out if you're interested. Uh, but this latest release has of at least Firefox 83 has added a bunch of new features, including a new security feature called HTTPS only mode. Now, this is similar to extensions like HTTPS Everywhere, but it's not exactly the same. So just to be clear, it's disabled by default right now. And if, if, if enabled, navigating to an HTTP site automatically redirects to an HTTPS site. So if no secure connection is available, a warning comes up with an option to continue or not. And insecure resources such as images loaded over HTTP are blocked. So if you use this, it may cause an issue depending on the kind of website you go to. But at the same time, it also adds an extra bit of security, which is great. So there's settings. The fa settings are found in the, pri the preferences under the privacy and security section if you want to enable this. They've also done a, a, some changes to the web render, which is disabled by default, but support in uh, upcoming for Firefox 84 promises to enable re web render by default for, uh, on Linux. So this will be also only for X11, not Wayland. And, um, you know, that kind of thing, but it's making massive progress in order, in order to, you know, improve the overall layout of the uh, Firefox and improve the performance for the web for rendering and that kind of thing. So that's cool. Uh, but one of the things that is, it seems like something that isn't going to be that interesting, but I'm very interested in this. And that is the ability to have support for Acroform which allows users to fill in, print, and save supported PDF forms. So it allows you to, without having to have an extra program, fill in fields on a PDF form, which is fantastic. And now there's so many times I wish I could just easily do that and not have to get an... Because I, I very rarely deal with PDF forms or you know those kinds of files. So when I do, it's uh, kind of annoying. I have to get an application that will work with that functionality. And having it built into Firefox is just really, really cool. So I'm happy to see them do that. And it's not, doesn't seem like a huge feature to talk about and be excited about, but I am because when I do have to deal with it, it will be a lot of a, like, a lot less of a headache in order to have it built into Firefox. So that is awesome. Also, they have improvements for a variety of different things. Uh, they have a new uh, print selection context menu item for when you print stuff. Also, there's a new fresh look for the v PDF viewer. And they have a new uh, VPN card and banner in the protections dashboard to make it easier to use a VPN solution, which is really, really nice. And they've also done some improvements to the overall layout of the interface and user experience. Like, for example, there's a new shortcut for Control shift b to open the bookmarks toolbar. Now, this is something that might not be that interesting to a lot of people, but 
in order to you can open the bookmarks uh, sidebar, but you for a long time couldn't open the bookmarks toolbar unless you were using an extension to make that function. And that's not always the best thing to have it just an extension just for that sort of stuff. But for those who like to save real estate of the vertical nature, and you have the uh, bookmarks toolbar hidden allows you to see more of the website. And having it built in as a shortcut so that when you don't need to see the toolbar, it's hidden. But when you do want to get to it, you can. And that's very, very cool. They've also done a lot of other stuff like improvements to the picture and picture system, support for keyboard shortcuts that make it possible to fast forward and rewind videos in the picture and picture mode, which is fantastic. And there's been a lot of other improvements as well. So if you want to check out the latest release of Firefox, which is Firefox 83, I have a link to it to the to release notes and all that stuff in the show notes below. And I can't wait to get the latest version because, well, I want to see all of those features and I definitely want to try out that PDF form thing because that just sounds not super awesome, but super convenient, which is awesome. So there you go. Links in the show notes below. Up next in the show is some interesting stuff from Mozilla related to DOH. So there's been a little bit of controversy around DOH and whether or not it actually adds security or whether it creates issues and whatnot. So based on this kind of uh, f- feedback, the Mozilla is uh, the Mozilla team is actually opening public consultation before rolling it out worldwide for the DOH. So for those who are not familiar, DOH it means uh, D- DNS over HTTPS, and that is basically where about encrypting DNS queries, which are normally sent out in clear text, hiding them inside of normal looking HTTPS web traffic. Prints prevents someone from observing the traffic in transit, so they don't know what your what which domain you're looking up. Now, they can't change the IP you get back to something else, though. So if you use DOH in order to go to a website, it won't really hide necessarily where you're going because the IP will be still sent back through. So because a DNS request is just a way to kind of get a website's IP, once you travel to that IP, then the ISP would still be able to see what that is in a reverse lookup kind of thing. But anyway, Mozilla has opened today a public comment and consultation period where about the ways it could enable support for the controversial uh, privacy-centric DNS over HTTPS or DOH protocol inside of Firefox. So they say that stakeholders have from November 19th to January 4th, 2021 to file their opinions, which Mozilla said it plans to take into consideration as long as they're reasonable and have the interests of its users in mind. And specifically ZDNet saying that the stakeholders refers to people who are like governments and ISPs and that sort of stuff. So I don't think it's like general interest kind of like comments, that kind of thing. But um, there was actually some... Decisions based on the the there's some UK blowback for the DNA, DNA DOH stuff. So UK government officials and like and agencies and stuff like that have criti- criticized Mozilla for developing and rolling out or wanting to roll out DOH, which is interesting because they even went as far. We talked about this last year uh, how some people were like nominated Mozilla for the year. Uh, some award for like internet villain of 2019 or some other nonsense. And it, we talked about in the previous episode, if you want to find, uh, you want to, I'll have a link in the show notes for that episode. If you want to learn more about that, but essentially it was nonsensical weirdness because basically they're attacking Mozilla for doing this, something that Google Chrome has already done. Mozilla has addressed most of the DOH criticism already. Add, they added a canary domain that can be queried on managed networks to force Firefox to disable DOH support and defer to local enterprise policies for DNS management in case, uh, for example, if a government or an organization wants to have their own management of DNS so they wouldn't, so basically um, enables people to bypass. Uh, or basically this structure says that they were arguing that it would be, uh, it would allow people to bypass enterprise firewalls and parental control block lists. But this approach now makes that, uh, you know, you can not, not break that bypass essentially. So uh, this also has added a section to the Firefox option page to manage DOH settings. They've added support for additional default DOH providers, which inside of Firefox uh, besides just Cloudflare, And moving forward, they say that Mozilla has been testing the feature at scale since February of this year with the plan to eventually roll out DOH to all of their users worldwide. So it's also interesting that Apple, Google, and Microsoft have also announced plans to support DOH with Google's DOH support going live for all of Chrome's users earlier this year already. Uh, And during the initial phase of the rollout, DOH will enable via Firefox studies 
Uh, if you have accepted the notification, you may later opt out by typing about studies and changing configurations there. But for, it's just interesting because there's a, there's a lot of people who are, kind of, it's kind of controversial saying that this is not an, a good thing. But at the same time, other people are saying that it's good for security. And they're saying, and most of the time when they're saying it's not good, it's because of the example of some of the ISPs are actually given um, status of like the same way that Cloudflare has, where they're they're using a DOH, they're a DOH provider. Some ISPs like Comcast are set as DOH providers. Let me know what you think in the comments below because I'm very curious what you think about this whole thing uh, as far as the DOH stuff that rolling out for Firefox as well as the other browsers that are also doing it. So let me know what you think in the comments below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust. And if you're not familiar with the password manager, it's a great way to have a balance of security and convenience when using online accounts. You can get started by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get your free account. But also, you might want to check out their premium edition because it gives you a bunch of extra features and it's only $10 per year. That's right, only $10 per year. So why would you need a password manager? Well, these days, web, basically every website wants you to create an account there. And it's best practice to have a different password for each website, actually each account on each website, because if any accounts or any websites get hacked, then you don't have to worry about all the other accounts that you have everywhere else. But it also is a difficult thing to keep track of that, and that's why you need a password manager. And with Bitwarden, you also get not only a password vault, but you also get password generation, so it'll automatically create the passwords for you. It will work on all of your devices, so mobile, desktop, browser plugins, and even the command line if you want to. And it has all the same, all the great features that you expect, as well as uh, autofill passwords, so you don't have to type it in your password yourself. It'll just do it for you, which I use every day, all the time. And they care uh, so much about security, and that's one of the reasons I'm a big fan of Bitwarden. Because Bitwarden is not only uh, focused on having the best security possible for a password manager, they also are 100% open source, which proves that they are very confident in their code. And in addition to that, they also do security audits to make sure that their confidence is well-placed so that the software is as best as it can be. And Another thing that reason, another sh proof that they are so interested in so security is that they are doing the Open Source Security Summit on December 10th. So it's a global event that's talking about solving security challenges and all sorts of stuff like that. So if you're interested, I'll have a link in the show notes below about the Open Source Security Summit so that if you'd like to attend it, you will know how to easily get started with that. But again, you also want to get started with the password manager from Bitwarden because it is a fantastic piece of software. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. But if you're like me, though, you want to show your appreciation and get that premium account because in addition to having all the great features that you get by default, you also get one gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, and Duo, Vault Health Reports, TOTP, Authenticator Storage and Generation, and so much more. So make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. But if you're like me, you'll want to do the, show your appreciation and get that premium edition, especially since it's only $10 per year. Thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is an interesting thing that I want to cover because it's basically a rumor, but I'm just, I think it's interesting because there's supposedly, a, according to Bloomberg, EQT is planning to IPO for the open source enterprise Linux based company, uh, SUSE. So EQT is a Swedish based private equity firm. SUSE is the leading EU Linux distribution distributor, uh, and they uh, EU as in European Union. And there's some rumors happening right now about whether or not EQT will make uh, SUSE do an IPO and be spun off into an independent thing like that. Which is it's it's interesting because the SUSE has grown grown a lot over the years, and they've actually even grown. Uh, their revenue over the over this course of this year, which is especially interesting also considering COVID stuff. Uh, so they said that they have a 14% year-over-year increase and also reported a 35% increase year-to-date in customer deals. So this it's interesting to see what, because there's a lot of times there have been companies who have had IPO rumors all the time, uh, like oh, Canonicals had IPO rumors often. I think this is the first time that SUSE has been in those, that rumor mill. Uh, and I, th I think it's interesting to see what would happen because they say that if it went IPO, it'd be a $6 billion IPO, which is just crazy. Uh, so that sounds good for SUSE. I don't know exactly if it would be or not. But in July, SUSE actually agreed to buy Rancher Labs, uh, which is a, a Kubernetes thing. So it's it's interesting to see what's happening with this space because SUSE is getting bigger and bigger 
And I think there's a lot of potential for uh, SUSE to get, you know, exponentially bigger depending on whether they do this IPO or not. Um, and I think that either way that it's going to get bigger, uh, especially considering OpenSUSE Tumbleweed has gotten so much, like it's just gotten so much better. And the this OpenSUSE jump that they're doing to combine some of the stuff with OpenSUSE and some of the stuff with SLEE is very cool. And uh, obviously that's not really related to the enterprise level, but it's something that I think is very interesting that they're doing. So anyway... This is all essentially just a rumor, and there's no confirmation whatsoever from SUSE. In fact, they say, as a company, we are constantly exploring ways to grow, but as a matter of corporate policy, we do not comment on rumor or speculation in the market. I'm curious to see what happens here. If it becomes a reality or just stays a rumor, there we go. If you want to learn more about this, I'll have a link to the ZDNet post about it, as well as the Bloomberg post for more details if you're interested. Links in the show notes below. Up next in the show is an application I think a lot of people will be interested in. It's an image editor that is meant to be a lightweight type of editor and also an alternative to paint.net, and that is LazPaint. So LazPaint is a free cross-platform image editor like Paintbrush or paint.net written in Lazarus, which is a based on free Pascal. Uh, it uses the BGRABIT map library or BGRABIT map. I, I, I don't know if you're supposed to say it like that, but I want it to be like that, so that's why. Anyway, it supports all major file formats like uh, bitmaps and 3D files and all sorts of stuff. It also has the ability to export to Krita, which is really cool. It has all the basic stuff that you want, like selection tools, uh, crop to selection, selection pin tools, invert selection, you know, flip horizontally, vertically, all that kind of thing, zooming. Uh, it has colorization aspects for uh, colorized shift colors, intensity, uh, brightness and lightness, uh, negative colors, all sorts of stuff related to that. And, and also it has blur functionality where you have motion blur, custom blur, radial blur, uh, pixelate tool. Uh, it has uh, image resampling for various quality settings. It also has improve. Uh, it has abilities to convert images into negatives. It has the ability to resize the canvas. So that's actually pretty, uh, it, that's a pretty powerful feature in a lightweight ed uh, image editor. So that's cool. It has all kinds of other features. And if you're interested in any kind of image manipulation and you want something that is lightweight, that still has a significant amount of features, but isn't trying to be, you know, a comparative to Photoshop and whatever, then maybe check out Last Paint. I'll have a link to it in the show notes below for those who are interested. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tuxedo channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many more. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux if or a t-shirt by going to the DLN store at dlnstore.com. The DLN store is where you can find all sorts of awesome stuff, including the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt, which is a shirt I made to convey the message that whether or not you know Linux is there or not, it probably is. And that is why Tux is blended into the background of the shirt to convey that message. And also, we have other ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, Humble Bundle, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. And if you want some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux as I'm a co-host of that show, and also check out Hard Radix as I'm a co-host of that show as well. Both of these shows are fantastic, awesome podcasts. I'm not biased in any way whatsoever. You can check those out by going to destinationlinux.network, as well as all the other awesome content on the network. And also, did you know that this show is streamed live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time or 18 100 UTC. There you go. For those who are not familiar with the North American time zones, <laughs> there you go. 1800 UTC for those, uh, you know, in, everywhere else. And if you're, if that's still, if that's not helpful, we also still have a time zone converter link that is in the description and the show notes to make it easy to convert it to whatever your time zone is. So check that out in the links in the description or in the show notes. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Donnell with Destination Linux Network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. And I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux. Good news.